Late last month, the New England Journal of Medicine published interim results of a trial assessing the effectiveness of a reversal agent for the anticoagulant dimigotran, the direct thrombin inhibitor marketed in the United States as Pradaxa. Dimigotran is used to prevent stroke in patients with non-valvular atrial fibrillation and to treat and prevent venous thromboembolism. It has advantages over warfarin, such as the ability to give fixed dose regimens without the need for dosage adjustments and monitoring of clotting times. However, there has been no proven way to reverse the bigger trans effects in the face of serious bleeding events, such uh, whether spontaneous or, or due to trauma. The NEJM paper describes a monoclonal antibody fragment, I dare you Cizumab, it's called, that quickly reverses the bigger trans anticoagulant effect. The paper's first author, Charles Pollock, Jr., is Associate Provost for Innovation and Education at Thomas Jefferson University, where he is Professor of Emergency Medicine. He kindly agreed to participate in this Medstro Open Forum, which started last Wednesday, July 8th, and ends on Thursday, July 16th. Welcome, Dr. Pollock. Thank you, Joe. This uh, is an interim analysis. The trial is about a third complete. You analyzed 90 of about 300 planned patients. Uh, did you judge the results at this stage uh, important enough to, to publish now? Or was this a planned um, analysis? Joe, we did have a planned interim analysis. Uh, we didn't necessarily plan to publish it, but the, there's a, a tremendous interest in this issue of specific reversal agents for the so-called novel or direct oral anticoagulants. Uh, and the results from the first 90 patients, uh, which included both bleeding patients and patients who were on dabigatran but needed emergency surgery that couldn't be postponed so there was concern about hemostasis, uh, the, the results with adaricizumab in this uh, cohort of 90 patients were so striking that we felt it was important to go ahead and, and share that with the with a very uh, eager community to learn about these issues, even while we're still doing the study. Yes, I I, I noticed that in the primary uh, outcome measurement, the the range was uh, between 100 percent and 100 percent reversal for the people yes. analyzed. I I had never I had never seen a a confidence interval like that before. Yeah, it's it's unusual, but it it, it does uh, it, it does show that at least in terms of laboratory assessment of anticoagulation uh, from the bigger trend, this uh, this drug adesivumab is is quite potent. You're an emergency medicine specialist, and so what do clinicians do now for patients who are bleeding on uh, the bigger trend? Well. Uh, there are people, of course, who have bleeding complications on dabigatran and the anti-10A NOACs. As you pointed out, dabigatran is the only uh, licensed antithrombin, anti-2A agent. Uh, these agents all, the, the, the twos and the tens together, share the characteristic compared to warfarin of having uh, a shorter half-life, which means that whatever problems you get into, you, you're in them for a shorter period of time. Uh, a, a better safety margin in general, in particular, uh, of a better safety margin on intracranial bleeding, which is the, the most feared complication of long-term anticoagulation with warfarin. Uh, these four drugs in the meta-analysis, that's the bigotran and then the 10 A's, uh, rivaroxaban, apixaban, and adoxaban, the four drugs have about a 60% lower incidence of intracranial hemorrhage than, than warfarin. Uh, so the fact of the matter is you don't get into trouble with these drugs uh, as much or as deeply. But of course it can still happen with any anticoagulant. You can have bleeding complications and you can have emergent situations arise where you would really like to take the anticoagulation away so that you can do something that involves sticking something sharp into the body. So for all of these agents, there are uh, general approaches to management, which include stabilization and resuscitation, fluid administration, including transfusion if needed. Uh, and then uh, you can try to replace uh, some, some clotting agents. It's a little more complicated than it is with warfarin, where, where warfarin prevents the uh, the synthesis of the vitamin K dependent factors 2, 7, 9, 10, protein C and protein S. With dabigatran and with the oral 10 A's, uh, you, you don't have a, a, an actual lack of these factors, it's just that they're inhibited. Uh, but until we have specific reversal agents on the market, the best thing you can do for those really dire circumstances, which fortunately are quite rare, 
so that the exsanguinating hemorrhage, the multiple trauma patient who's hemodynamically unstable or the intracranial bleed, what to do at this point beyond just stabilization and resuscitation and waiting for the effect to wear off, uh, would include uh, potentially a four-factor prothrombin complex concentrate, uh, perhaps recombinant factor 7A. The Bigotran, unlike the other NOACs, the 10A NOACs, is dialyzable. Now, that's a great thing to know scientifically. Practically, it's a little challenging. You've got a patient who's dying in front of you, and you need to start emergency hemodialysis. That, that can be a big challenge even the, in the most equipped of emergency departments. But basically, what we do is, is aimed at general support of the patient replacement of what's missing and trying to fix what's leaking uh, in the absence un until adiacizumab is approved of a specific reversal agent. Um, so what are the chances roughly of spontaneous bleeds uh, on Pradaxa, dibigatran, uh, and how do they compare with warfarin? I did a little background reading and uh, is, is it about 1.5 percent? Yeah, it's, uh, so, so we're talking major bleeds. You know, anybody on an anticoagulant, whether it's warfarin, one of the 10As or dibigatran, is going to have occasional bruising, maybe some nosebleeds. Premenopausal women may have some some uh, menorrhagia. Um, if they have to have their blood drawn, they may see hematoma arise there. You know, th these are sort of nuisance bleeds that we don't have to worry about. If you're talking about the kind of bleed that would have qualified a patient for enrollment in reverse AD, so uh, a bleed that the clinician on the scene views as severe, as life-threatening, uh, as warranting immediate reversal. We're talking about 1.5 percent or less per year. For warfarin, it's closer to 3 percent. So, so according to the Pradaxa website, there are roughly a million people in the United States uh, on Pradaxa, um, and so back of the envelope the calculations say that there were roughly anywhere from 10 to 20,000 people might need idiocizumab uh, at some point. Yeah, and again, what's important to realize is that even patients with severe bleeds don't necessarily need reversal. Uh, for example, if a patient uh, uh, has, has you know, missed the last couple of doses of the bigotran but comes in bleeding, there's probably not a good case for reversing the dibigotran because the bigotran is probably not even effective at that point. Yeah. We don't have ready uh, methods in the U.S. for assessing the anticoagulation intensity with the bigotran. But you can sort of ballpark it by looking at the activated partial thermoplastin time, uh, that the APTT. And if the APTT is not elevated, then the patient probably doesn't have uh, much in the way of active dibigotran on board. So even patients who meet that criterion for major bleed, you know, sometimes patients bleed independent of their anticoagulation therapy. Uh, a patient who's in a, in a big car wreck and comes in with bleeding in his thorax and his abdomen and his pelvis uh, is going to bleed a lot whether he's on dibigotran or not. So... I, I, there still has to be some clinical judgment applied, but I, I would I would agree with you that from a back of the envelope perspective, that's sort of a ballpark figure of the potential class of, of eligible patients. Uh, and this was a dosage of five grams Correct. of of a monoclonal antibody. A and a, uh, excuse me, it's, that's a big dose of a monoclonal it, antibody. It, it is, and uh, and it's got to be infused. And as I was reading your paper. Uh, I was struck, as was the editorialist in the journal, by the fact that 25% of the patients that were enrolled on clinical grounds uh, were in a normal clotting state, it turned out, uh, thus making the treatment with uh, idereucizumab unnecessary. Does this mean that we need a way to test for dibigotran-related uh, anticoagulation in patients uh, judged to be at risk? A clinical risk during these bleeds? Uh, in an ideal world, yes. In a practical world, uh, it would be of some benefit, but it's not a, a, a necessary element of the evaluation of patients. Uh, you said 25% of patients were enrolled on clinical grounds. I just want to clarify for the audience that 100% of the patients were enrolled on clinical grounds. There, there are no laboratory enrollment criteria right. for the study. We asked the clinician on the scene at the bedside uh, who had, of course, been trained in the protocol and knew that we were not looking for nuisance patients or for, excuse me, nuisance bleeding in patients. No patients are nuisance patients. Uh, for surgical procedures, it could be delayed a day where the debigotran effect would wear off. So they're, they're, they're assessing these patients based on the, their, their field for whether the patient needs immediate reversal. So it's real so, world. Yeah, it's, it's, we, we, tried, we, we tried very hard to, to, and we're still, you know, the study's ongoing. Yeah. We're trying to replicate the, the real world use of this drug. I will tell you that with warfarin, we do have a rapid turnaround readily available assay for how anticoagulated people are, and that's the internationalized, uh, international normalized ratio, the INR. 
But I will also tell you that as a practicing emergency physician, if I've got a patient who comes in who is known to be taking warfarin, who has uh, altered mental status or perhaps is comatose, we get a CT scan and on the first cut I see a big bleed in his head. I'm giving him four-factor prothrombin complex concentrate without waiting for the INR to come back. And I think that's what we saw in a lot of these patients who are enrolled in reverse AD, the, uh, the minority of patients who actually had normal clotting tests in retrospect. Yeah, I think we, we don't really, we reviewed the cases and we don't really have any quarrel with the, with the clinicians who enrolled the patients at the time. Uh, you're, you're absolutely right though with your question. If, if we had a, a rapid turnaround, readily accessible way to evaluate just how anticoagulant the patient was, we might make better decisions about a dairy system abuse. The good thing is the, the, uh, the patients who, again, with the benefit of retrospect, were not anticoagulated, uh, but were exposed to our system app anyway, it gives us a great safety population. Right. And, uh, and, and it's, it's re re uh, reassuring to see that we had no drug-related uh, adverse events in the study so far. We're still continuing the study and, of course, watching very carefully with those sorts of problems. Uh, we, we, we just talked about the, the fact that it's five grams of, of the monoclonal antibody fragment, and that's not as easily gathered as, say, harvesting sea salt. Um, <laughs> so, so, so the journal's editorialist says that I dare use Isimab, the quotes, will surely be a costly medication, end quote. And one commentator in, uh, in uh, NEJM Journal Watch uh, suggested that uh, patients on dabigatran should carry around a vial of I dare use cizumab just in case. Uh, but that clearly would be either too expensive or uh, uh, it might become the new EpiPen for people on. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I think uh, you know people with a deathly allergy to bee sting should carry an EpiPen because there are a lot of bees out there. Uh, if, if we look at the the likelihood of a true emergent life-threatening bleed on the bigger trend, it's, it's pretty doggone small. And as we discussed earlier, not even all of those patients really necessarily need a dariusizumab depending on the rest of their clinical scenario. So I, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm an academic physician. I don't work for Behringer. I don't have any access to anything that's not public in terms of how they plan to price the, the drug. I'm told that they are uh, exceedingly sensitive to what the market is concerned about for pricing, and I'm sure we'll see something from them soon. Uh, but I, I don't think we'll ever get to the point where uh, where people need to carry it around with them. Uh, I, you know, speaking of, of Beringer uh, Ingelheim, I, I did ask them uh, for a rough estimate of uh, what the I dare use Cizumab might cost. But uh, they got back to me and they said, look, it's not approved by the FDA, and so they have no information to give. But they say they'll be in touch with me um, if they do. So um, I'm looking forward to that. Um, and uh, I, I'm, the reason I'm asking the, the question of them, and I um, was interested in, in your take on it, is the fact that uh, uh, one of the things that's entering increasingly into clinical uh, discussions is price. Uh, mm -hmm. According to, uh, according to uh, Neil Shah and his uh, co-authors in the book that they've just written, a lot of clinicians have no idea what it costs. To, to do these treatments, and uh, patients come out surprised, especially if they are not covered by health insurance, or if they are, what the uh, new deductibles are announced as being. So, so, so. Uh, it, it, you know, it's, 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 it's absolutely legitimate concern. I, I, I feel quite confident that Beringer Ingelheim shares uh, the sense that it's a, a serious concern. Uh, I, I, you know, th there is a. Uh, an, an acquisition cost issue here that fat fragments are not cheap to make. Uh, but I, I think, again, the, the company is, is committed, at least based on what they've told me, to, to having what they're calling a reasonable price for this drug. Yeah. Uh, and, and, yeah, I, I think ideally every emergency department should have a couple of patients worth of, of drug on, on hand. And there'll be a lot of emergency departments that uh, they go a year or two without using it. You know, we just as a sense of, of how rare these incidents are, we, we've got 400 sites around the world trying to recruit 300 patients. So, you know, you, you talk about back of the envelope uh, calculations, that means there are a lot of sites we expect to be monitoring and, and uh, very vigilant looking for these patients that never enroll one. So it really is a fairly uncommon presentation. The issue for clinicians is when they do happen, they're very dramatic and you tend to remember them. Right. 
Um, and if this, and if uh, I dare you, system app does turn out to be effective, what sort of enthusiasm for it do you see among among your your colleagues? Well, I think there's a tremendous uh, desire to have a specific reversal strategy for all of these drugs. You know, if there's a problem with adarizumab, it's that it only works with omegatran and, <laughs> and doesn't have any impact on the other uh, oral anticoagulants. But uh, as, as I mentioned, the majority of uh, the omegatran related bleeding is either nuisance bleeding that doesn't need any treatment, uh, other than perhaps holding the drug for a dose, uh, or bleeding that can be managed simply with, with standard resuscitation measures. For those occasional patients, that little tip of the iceberg that, uh, uh, that really clinically warrants immediate reversal, I think there will be a lot of enthusiasm for having this available. In the paper, there were a couple of patients in whom the treatment didn't seem to work. For the most part, it worked within minutes, as, as you yeah. observe. Um, two had uh, high, still had high concentrations of dibigatran despite the infusions. What could be at play there? Well, and I should point out, even those patients had a good immediate response, but the, the levels popped back up afterwards. Yeah. Um, the, you, you mentioned earlier the five gram dose, and I, I said that's a big dose. Uh, in, in discussion with regulators on both sides of the Atlantic in designing this study, we're trying to figure out how much a dairy system we should give. We wanted to make this a simple study for investigators so we didn't want to have to titrate it or base it on renal function where that means you have to wait on a creatinine to come back or, or wait, anything like that. So what we did was we looked at the dibigatran levels, the actual mass spec measured levels of dibigatran. Uh, that were obtained in patients with atrial fibrillation in the RELY study. Uh, the RELY study was a study of the bigotran versus warfarin in atrial fibrillation. So it was an older patient population, didn't have a lot of comorbidities, and we thought that was probably the kind of patient we'd end up enrolling in reverse AD. And we came up with, with 5 grams because 5 grams has the capacity, the biologic capacity, to, to take care of, to bind up, to remove the 99th percentile of the levels we saw in reverse AD, in uh, RELOC. Uh, so that's the dose that carried forward to um, uh, to reverse AD. Turns out two and a half grams would have easily taken care of the, the median or average values in RELOC, but we wanted an overwhelming dose, and the regulators liked that idea. Uh, so, uh, yeah, the, we're happy with that, and as you pointed out, the, in the vast majority of these first 90 patients, it worked great. Uh, there, you know, the 99th percentile is not the 100th percentile, and there are situations where occasionally patients will have higher levels than even 5 grams combined, uh, and the cases we could envision, uh, both of which were seen in the study, uh, is a deliberate intentional overdose of dibigatran uh, in patients with acute renal shutdown, uh, because of course dibigatran clearance is dependent on, on some renal function. Uh, the, the good thing to point out is that these patients who tended to drift back up towards the end of the, the monitoring period of, of coagulation studies, which was 24 hours, did not have any bleeding episodes. So they had higher levels of dibigatran than we would have expected, but they didn't seem to have any clinical consequences. Now, you know, we're enrolling 210 more patients, so we'll, we'll obviously be looking very vigilantly to see if that changes. But right now, we view it as a, as a biologic phenomenon that there was just so much dibigatran available, the, the uh, uh, adariacizumab couldn't bond at all, or it may be that over time, because adariacizumab itself has a fairly short half-life, over time patients may uh, sort of mobilize the bigotran that was trapped out in the peripheral tissues and it comes back in and can be measured, but it doesn't seem to do much in the way of anticoagulation. Okay. Um, so you are continuing to enroll patients, and I, yeah. I, I guess you don't want to reveal any of your results, and, and I'm, I'm not asking you to, but I want to uh, uh, say good luck with the continuing study. And uh, mm -hmm. I want to thank you, Dr. Pollock, for uh, spending time with us today. Thank you very much for the opportunity.